Good evening, everyone. This is uh, Olivier Cornet here um, in the gallery, in the Olivier Cornet gallery. I am in the exhibition room where we have Owen McLaughlin's uh, current exhibition, uh, COVID Eyes. So you're all very welcome. I hope you can hear me loud and clear. Um, just to uh, give you a bit of a presentation. Well, first of all, Jean Ryan, the art historian and storyteller Jean Ryan is in the other room. So um, um, she come a bit later. Um, so just give you, to give you a bit of a background um, about once upon a time in an art gallery. Well, once upon a time in an art gallery is a collaboration between the Olivier Cornet Gallery, myself as a gallerist, and art historian and storyteller Jean Ryan. Uh, Jean Ryan is an Irish art historian who has a special interest in artworks which are influenced by literature. This approach enables her to introduce Irish artists from eras as diverse as the 18th century through to contemporary practitioners who are still influenced by stories of any genre. Through storytelling, Jean has introduced people to artworks held in some of the best Irish museums, public galleries, art centers, private collections, and national institutions. Jean's work has taken her to places as diverse as Dublin Castle, Rua Red, Municipal Gallery DLR Lexicon in Dunleary, Christchurch Cathedral in Dublin, the National Design and Craft Gallery in Kilkenny, and the Olivier Cornet Gallery here in Dublin. We have, um, over the years, run a few events with Jean, even prior to creating Once Upon an Art, Once Upon a Time, sorry, in an art uh, gallery. Really, the aim of this collaboration is to create an environment of discovery and moments where the visitors, well, here, listeners tonight, where the visitors encounter Irish artworks after listening to the story which influenced the artist. So for this online event taking place tonight, an online, online event uh, in the context of Owen McLaughlin's COVID Eyes uh, exhibition, you're about to hear a story, a story written and told by Jean, a story that influenced an artwork in the gallery. As the story unfolds, you'll be able to see selected works from the gallery. If you prefer, you can also close your eyes and just listen to the story. Um, but among the selected works that you'll be able to see, one of which was influenced by the story you're about to listen to. If there is an element of the story that really resonates with you and creates an image, we'll ask you to hold on to it and wait until later, until you see that moment that the artist, in this case, Owen McLaughlin, chose from the same story. The story lasts about 15 minutes, 17 minutes uh, to be precise, after which Jean will tell you about, about the background of the story and its author. After that, you'll see the actual work behind me, um, and you'll be able to, um, to, if you like, to not confront, but to see the work relative to the image that you've created for yourself. And from the next minutes, Jean will talk about the actual work before the artist, Owen McLaughlin, joins her in conversation. So I'm going to disappear and I'm going to play the recording. I hope you enjoy it. And I might come back later just to say a few final words. So enjoy the evening. I hope you're sitting comfortably at home. Uh, you might be having a drink and um, talk to you later and enjoy the evening. Thank you. Once upon a time, there was a fjord in Norway where a community lived. Their founder, the Dean, a prophet in the minds of his followers, had chosen that majestic place because he thought it would enhance the lived experience of his followers. The brothers and sisters who chose to live simple lives, listening and reading the word of God, 
rejecting and saying nay, nay to luxury and to extravagance and saying yay, yay to charity and goodness. Their chorus of homes were brightly painted in yellows, blues, reds and oranges. And from these simple wooden houses, the congregation looked to the west and they saw the ever changing ocean with its infinite horizon and felt small. To the east, their vision was corralled by the mountains to the very point in the fjord where sky, sea and mountains merged. They lived in a wedge of heaven. They felt so safe there. This was a place where nothing much happened, where the rhythm of life is predictable. So when an event occurred, the inhabitants remembered it for years and years. When the two sisters looked back to June the 20th, 1871, they felt profound gratitude because that's the day a stranger, a woman with sad eyes came into their life. She managed to struggle through a storm that raged down the fjord for two days. She was carrying a bag. It was her only possession. She held it close to her. Her head bowed low against the rain and the wind and she could have been swept into the sea at any time. She was utterly, utterly alone. She was nearing the end of a long, sad journey. She was far from home. She knocked on the door of the yellow house, the only one in the village. Would it be opened by the two sisters she'd been sent to? Were they still there? The sisters opened the door to find a woman standing in the rain, mute, exhausted. Her eyes were deep, tired and troubled. They brought her into the fire and before she took off her sodden coat, she dug deep into her bag and handed them a letter. Their names in an unfamiliar hand on the envelope. The sisters read the letter. It was written in French. It was written by an opera singer who had been in that very room 15 years previously. Their father, the dean, well, he'd been alive then. The opera singer was on holidays at the, that time, traveling through Norway after a season singing in the greatest opera houses in Europe. Later, he was to recall that the greatest duet he ever performed was in that modest room, accompanied by the older sister. She had a voice that could caress and hollow out sounds. She could create fissures and crevices and sacred music. Before he left, he told her he had never heard a voice like hers. And he told her, you will be a great artist in heaven. You will enchant the angels. In his letter of introduction, he told them about the distressed stranger with the deep, sad and empty eyes. She needed sanctuary and care. She had lost everyone she loved and everything she had, and she was lucky to escape France. She was wanted by the state because she had fought at the barricades with the communards in Paris. She was an arsonist and she'd be guillotined just like her son and husband were if she was captured. Her only chance of escape was through her nephew, who was a cook on the boat which was going to Norway. She knew of the opera singer's experience there and asked if he knew anyone who could help her. He immediately thought of the two sisters and their yellow house. He wrote that the stranger's name was Babette and that she could cook. Babette waited. She searched and looked up into these two faces, wondering what her fate would be. The sisters were aghast. How could one page of a letter hold such suffering? Now they had very little French and they had no need for a cook and they had no money to pay her. But suffering, despair and vulnerability are not easy to ignore when you have compassion as a compass of your life. Of course, the sisters would give her shelter. Of course, they would give her a home. Time passed and Babette welcomed the simplicity of their lives. It healed her. She didn't mind the sisters had no money to pay her. She didn't mind they ate simple food. She saw more evidence of their kindness as they distributed most of the food to the sick and needy of their community. Babette gladly took over the cooking. Gradually, the community watched as this fearful woman began to feel at home with them. And like a beautiful plant in the landscape, she began to unfurl and reveal her inner beauty. She was no longer alone, no longer displaced. Her frightened and desperate look faded. And in turn, she nourished the community. She did this through her food, which now held new flavors taken from the very landscape around them. People began to feel stronger. Tummy settled. They didn't feel the cold so badly. They felt happier in themselves. She also nourished through her quiet magnetism, which created calm and stillness. The woman who appeared as a beggar turned out to be a conqueror. 
She didn't reveal much more about herself to the sisters, but when she spoke of her past, she said fate made her lose everything she had and everyone she loved. But fate brought her to a new home. Maybe fate would bring her luck, as she had a lottery ticket. Maybe one day she might win 10,000 francs. How she laughed at the idea. But 12 years later, she won 10,000 francs. A friend who held her numbers forwarded the good news to her in a letter. And when the money came, the sisters rejoiced with her. But Beth's glee was infectious. And the community stood around and they counted all the money into a beautiful wooden box. Nobody had ever seen so much money. But the community were sad because they were sure she would leave them. They were sure Babette would return to her former life. Babette did come to talk to the sisters, but she didn't announce her departure. Instead, she had a request. She asked if she could cook a French meal for the upcoming celebration of the Dean Centenary on the 12th of December that year. The two sisters were taken aback by her kindness, but they would off mark the occasion just with a simple meal with coffee. Babette insisted. She also insisted on paying for it. And when the sisters hesitated again, she told them she had never asked them for anything, which was true in the 12 years she'd been with them. So they had to agree, reluctantly though. Well, Babette was energized by the prospect of cooking a French meal again. She poured over the recipe she had carried in her bag all those years ago and she chose a very special menu for a very special occasion for very special people. When she'd done so, she wrote to the finest food emporiums in Paris and placed her order. Her nephew, who was still working on the ship, he guaranteed her the food would arrive in time for the meal. She waited. December came and the food and drink arrived on time. Now Babette got to work with ingredients she hadn't seen in years. She was full of joy. She sniffed, poked, tasted. She blanched, chopped, steeped, poured, boiled, reduced, baked, roasted, poached. The kitchen was full of aromas and steam and in the middle of it all was Babette really enjoying herself. There was quail, caviar, truffles, hams, all of these on the menu. Fine wines, champagne, coffee and tea for afterwards. The sisters became alarmed. This was opulence which their father would wholly disapprove of, but they had given her their word. Things took an alarming turn when they heard something scurrying around the kitchen and peeped in to see a very large turtle. And that turtle was as frightened as they were. What was a turtle doing in their home? This was too much. They ran out of the house and gathered the brethren around them. There were 10 of the village elders asked to the meal. They also became alarmed as they listened to the two sisters. All that rich food, all that excess. The sisters never told them about the turtle. They prayed together and they looked for spiritual guidance. For Babette's sake, they decided to eat the food, but to pray not to taste it. They would be silent on all matters of food in that, that evening. Now there were two guests who didn't know of this decision. One was an elderly lady who had lost her sense of taste and smell anyway, and the other was her nephew, a general visiting with her from France for the occasion. He had visited the Yellow House before and had shared simple meals with his sisters and their father 30 years earlier. But now he was an important man. He had risen in society and eaten with royalty and in the best of restaurants. It began to snow on the evening of the meal. The brethren assembled in the yellow house. The parlour was empty. All the chairs were needed in the dining room. The sisters had lit the fire early so the room was cosy. They placed a garland of junipers around the father's portrait and lit candles on the mother's workplace just beneath it. The elders formed a circle in that room. They held hands and sang hymns to give them the resolve they needed for the impending meal. The other guests arrived just as Babette called them to dinner. The dining room was beautiful. Babette had thought of everything. Fine linen, napkins, wine glasses. Candles ran down the centre of the table and as each guest sat in their place, the candlelight shone on their face, the greys and blacks of their clothes and the red uniform that the general wore. They bowed their heads 
and said Gray solemnly. They sipped their drink and began to eat the first course in silence. The general sipped his drink. He sipped it again. He said to himself, this is an Amontillado. He tasted it again. It was. And he decided it was the finest he'd ever had. He tried the soup. Again, a taste explosion. He tasted it again. It was turtle soup, but it was the best turtle soup he'd had. He hadn't tasted as good since he ate in the Café Anglais in Paris all those years ago. He was incredulous. No one else seemed bothered. The second course was served. Plinis Dermidoff. Oh, the caviar, the truffle oil. He could taste the delicacy and the balance of that dish. When he looked around the table, they were all eating it without any surprise or approval, as if they ate it every day. But when he tasted the Vuelve Quilco, he turned to his neighbour saying, this is the famous 1860 Vuelve Quilco. It's the rarest vintage of that champagne. The neighbour the neighbor commented on the weather. The general drank and savoured each and every morsel. He didn't understand what was going on. But finally, the conversation rose around the table as the group shared stories about the Deem and his life. But the general couldn't believe it. When Kaya and Sacrifice was served, he put his knife and fork down and spoke about the dish to another guest, who replied, yeah, what else would it be? And quickly rejoined the conversation about a miracle the Dean had performed. Now the general really hadn't a clue what was going on. This was the best meal he had ever eaten. So now he just relaxed, relaxed and enjoyed himself. He partook of most of the wines and champagnes because the other guests sipped so slowly. But when the figs, peaches and grapes arrived at the end of the meal, he laughed. He pointed to a beautiful front bunch of grapes and said, beautiful grapes, to which his neighbour quoted scripture and said, and they came onto the brook of Eshkel and cut down a branch with one cluster of grapes and they bore it on two staffs. Hmm. Well, after that response, the general again just rejoined the lively conversation. Now, it was unusual for the elders who generally ate in relative silence. Over the course of the evening, small misunderstandings were sorted out. There was laughter and gaiety. The group enjoyed themselves immensely but they never commented on the food. It was time to go, but before they left, the general felt he should make a speech. And when he did, he stood up and words like righteousness, kindness, nobility and grace came out of his mouth. It wasn't the language he normally used. It was the language the Dean would have used. The night seems to possess a new magic for all in that room. The sky was now clear and the sisters thought the stars were nearer to them than ever before. The sparkle reflected on the surface of the very sea. After the guests had left, the sisters went into Babette, who was sitting quietly in the kitchen, surrounded with pots and pans to be washed. She was exhausted. They thanked her for the meal and was so sorry no one had said anything about her lively food, her lovely food. They were looking around for the turtle, relieved they hadn't eaten it. Babette turned to them and she announced that she was a famous cook and had worked in the Café Anglais in Paris. This meant nothing to him. She told them she created dishes for nobility. She told them she was an artist. The sisters were contrite and they said sadly that they would remember that meal and that evening when she'd returned to Paris. They would remember it forever. And that's when they heard she wasn't going back. Why would she go back there, she said. She had no one there that she loved. Anyway, she'd no money left. How? Where was all the money gone? It turned out she had spent every franc on the meal for that evening. The sisters were dumbfounded. Babette laughed. They didn't realise how much they charged for food in the Café Anglais all those years ago. They all sat in silence for a few minutes. 
But Babette spoke to them in a clear voice. And she said to them, I cooked that meal for all of you, but I also did it for myself to remind me of who I was, to remind me of my skill, to remind me I was an artist and I always will be. I had the joy of creating memorable evenings for other people and for you. They are so important in life. All the sisters, they went over to Babette and they embraced her. The older one saying words that had once been said to her. You will be a great artist in heaven. You, Babette, will enchant the angels. Good evening, everyone. My name is Jean Ryan, and you're so welcome to the Olivia Corner Gallery and to Once Upon a Time in the Olivia Corner Gallery. Gallery. I hope you enjoyed that story. It was written by a Danish writer called Karen Blixen, and she wrote in Danish and in English. And it was made into a film in 1987, and that film won an Academy Award. Now, Karen, for best film, Karen was a prestigious writer and she was shortlisted for the Nobel Prize in Literature in 1962. That's the year that John Steinbeck won it. For the purposes of this evening, I didn't watch the film. I went back to the original short story, which she wrote in 1957. And it was beautiful material to work, work with as a storyteller. And now you know the story that the artist knew. You can share that experience. And at the beginning of this, Olivier asked you to just imagine a moment that resonated with you. And before he comes and hangs up the work, I'm just going to say that to you again, because now you know the story. So maybe there was an aspect of that story, an emotion, maybe the kindness, maybe Babette's need, maybe Babette's vulnerability. But her ultimate triumph was a beautiful part of the story. But maybe something that was said in the story brought you back to a memory, to an actual place that exists rather than something that you imagine. Or maybe you let your imagination go with the story and you found expression in the landscape or in the home or the people. Anyway, hold that memory of yours because that's your response to the story. And I'm going to step out of the gallery now and Olivier is going to hang up the artist's response to the story. And I'll be back in a minute. So now you've had a few seconds to look at the image. This was a painting <clears throat> that was made in 2008 by an Irish artist called Owen McLaughlin. It's called Waiting and it's Babette. It's Babette's face. And before we talk to Owen about why he painted it, how he was influenced by the story, I just think it would be really good for me to point out a few things about this painting. One, it's very large. For a portrait, it's large because it's 90 centimeters by 120, which is three feet by, by four feet. And you're used to uh, canvases of that size. You've often seen them maybe for landscapes or maybe 
um, still live or something like that. But for the purposes of this image, it's a big, it's a big canvas. And Owen has used it and he's exploited the size of that canvas. And what he's done is he's created an image and he's created it in a very, very thoughtful way. Because if we look, put on my glasses, because if we look up a bit, we see that the face is really big. It's over half the size of the canvas. In fact, it's about nine times normal size. The woman would barely fit into this room if we added the rest of her body to her. And what he did was, he focuses in on the face in a number of ways. One, by the way he frames her. So she's framed with a very, very dark paint here and very, very dark paint here. So it's like she hovers, she emerges out of the darkness. And he, he, using this framing device, we see her completely. And that framing device is opposed, you might say, by a cropping device on the vertical. We don't see the top of her head, we don't see underneath her chin. And that's, a, that's a, a technique that artists can use. By doing that, he has placed her in a space that we don't know where she is. It's ambiguous. The only thing that you can make out, which I hope you can make out, is that there's a kind of a structure here, which maybe that light blue light is coming from. So those devices are very important in the context of what Owen is doing this painting. And now if we look at how he used color, if you want to kind of squint your eyes down, you'll be able to see that Owen has put down blocks of color. Here you have a very, very dense, dark, dark blue to purple. Beside it is this block of beautiful yellows, creams and ochres, beautiful. Beside that, you have a triangle shape of blue here. And here we have another triangle shape of the darkness on the other side of her face. And then we have a line here in the light blue that seems to describe something. It's softer. And then we go on into darkness and up into light again. So we have one light source in the painting and it's the blue from here. It's illuminating this part of her face. We haven't a clue where this light is coming from, but it's working. It's actually blasting this side of the face. So if we simplify it, you have dark, you have light, you have, you're going to darker, well, to blue, darker, blue, and dark again, and then light. And this, these two together, this, this lightness is even made stronger or more powerful because Owen has put this very, very dense color beside it. And now if we go on and look into what he is doing with his mark making. He is putting down color so subtly. On this part here, he has, there's no evidence of the artist's hand. There's no evidence of his brushwork. He has just put down paint in a matte fashion. He's done so here as well and here. But on her face, he has put down paint in quite a loose, nearly abstract way. So there are beautiful, beautiful combinations of there's creams, there's yellows, there's ochres, there's mustards, there's rusts, there's the brown, and very, very rich, beautiful line here. And when you look at the structure of the face, it's as if he has blocks of color moving across this canvas building up this image. It's beautiful, this beautiful brushwork, which you can't see because you're too far away. But I'd recommend if you can, you could come in and look at this beautiful painting. When we go on into the blues, again, you have beautiful colors of blue, lilac, powder blues, there's very light blues, there's turquoises. And yet, he's able to use the darkness when he wants to. Because if you look here, Owen has put down a very rich but dark brown. It's nearly black. 
and he's using it here again. There's a darkness here. It feeds into this darkness here and beyond. And then he uses, there's a harmony in it because the colors of the lips are then in the color of the eyes. So this is a beautifully constructed painting. And there's a, you can't see it here, maybe you can't, but there's a kind of an electric blue line that he must have done very, very quickly. And it divides just this highlight with the darkness and it's beautiful. And again, he's using this soft line to describe something. It's probably a show. And again, it's suggested and we can complete it and bring it around to the top, bring it around to the other side as we could complete the top of her head because we have enough information to do so. So, why, is, why has Owen made all these decisions? Well, he's, he focuses in completely on the person's face. He has created a beautiful image of emotion. This woman, through her eyes, he has painted anguish and fear, and he has done it in a way and painted her right at the surface of the canvas, like Caravaggio does. So there's an immediacy about her. It's hard to ignore her. So the viewer, you can, as a viewer, you cannot get away from the impact that she has. Olivier is going to come in and he's going to set us up on Zoom. But before he does, I'm going to leave you and just get you to imagine if Babette could speak. What would she be saying to you? What would you, what emotion do you attribute to this image? And I'll be back in a minute. I think you can come back. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, <Hello>. all. <laughs> How are you? Can hear me. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I'm going to stand to the side. I'm, you know, I'm like the I'm like the weather girl. Um, <laughs> oh, um, thanks a million for talking to me and thanks for your story. Work. Yeah. The first question I'm going to ask you is, as a storyteller. Uh, that's what my story's going to hat on is what and how did the story of the Beth's feast influence you? Why did you use that story in your practice? Yeah, well, it's um, it's a long story, really. Um, like I did the painting kind of 15 years ago or something like that, and um, it was during I was involved in the anti war movement at the time, and um, I was doing. Well, when I left college, I was doing these abstract work. I was doing kind of very quiet um, color abstracts. And um, then like at the weekend, I'd go on the march against trying to stop the war. And it just, in a way, it didn't seem combat compatible to have the two things going on at the same time. So gradually kind of, um, because with abstract work, you can't really kind of say anything it's, it's just a, a feeling in a way and um i suppose the more i went the more we were concerned with the um with the the coming war and that the more i was getting it was coming into the painting it was going into the studio so i actually um yeah okay another part of the story was you might remember um Donald Rumsfeld, the, was he the Secretary of Defense or something in America? And he had this um, pack of cards, which were uh, cards, 52 cards of the most wanted men in Iraq. And he was handing it out to um, soldiers as they went off. And it's like the Wild West, you know, we want those guys dead or alive, you know. And I really felt like you can go out there to Iraq and kill. 52 Iraqis, but it's not going to make the world a safer place. And um, so I started, my response was um, I was going to do 52 
dead Iraqis, really, like old and battered heads, but they were just um, close ups of heads. Well, I just created them, really, but um, they weren't actual Iraqis. Um, I was just um, painting these slightly abstract, but um, you'd know they were battered heads. And I was doing this, I, I, I don't think I ever reached 52 of them because um, it was just sort of not good for the soul to be kind of dwelling on this all the time. Um, um, so I painted Babette, one of the first ones. Um, it was like people who had been affected by the war, whether they're women and children and that. And like if I, when I had an exhibition in the art center, um, in the linen hall, like I'd have say 10, 15 battered heads, but then on the other wall, there'd be the bet or a picture of a child or whatever. So, um, and gradually, so so you can see there, there's, there's, it's still quite an abstract piece, even though it's figurative. And later on, I even became more, more photographic in a way. It's, um, that's kind of an, an in-between in a way. Um, if I was to talk about the, the painting itself, yes, yeah. she, Babette, Babette um, was where I, I never read the book, I saw the film. In fact, yeah. I look at the film um, every year, really. We look at the film every year here, yeah. and um, it's just the thing we do, and um, it's a wonderful film. And um, I suppose I, I was watching it one year, and I just it struck me this is a woman um, affected by a war. She'd been in, um, all her family had been killed in in France and um, yeah. she was fleeing and as you said, yeah. And um, when she arrived in that little Danish village, um, there was a storm out. She was wearing a big um, cloak. Right? Now that's a bit of her hair at the top, but mostly it's, uh, she's covered yeah. in it. <laughs> Was um, um, and the thing is, like, there was a storm. Like, in a way, you can see it's from a film because, like, there's a storm out, and she arrives, and the light, the light is kind of blue, stormy night, and then inside in the house where the she was just arriving, um, to the to two sisters, and there was a candle on the table, so the light came from the candle on this it's, side. Where it's it's like on. okay, okay, yeah. okay. Yeah. So, um, so is this the first? Is, sorry, is the, because I haven't watched the film. So when you decided to use the use this film as for that purpose of depicting somebody affected by war who's lost everything, this was the first time you you. I'm sure you went through the film and to find the image you wanted, but this is the first time you actually see her in the film. Yeah, she's just arrived, yeah. and she's um, uh, you, as yes. you mentioned, like um she has a letter and she gives yeah. it to the sisters and they're reading the letter and she's waiting anxiously to see um, will they let her in type of thing really. Yeah. 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 No, it's a, it's a stunning painting and you know the way you've uh, approached it um the way you've cropped it and the way you've framed it it's very powerful i think for the viewer. Um it's uh, the word i used was immediate and the way that she's on the surface, there's no distance between the viewer and her. So you just kind of concentrate on those eyes. It's really, really beautiful. But when I was um, looking at it, um, I saw lots of abstract shapes. And it was afterwards that I read that you had started as an abstract artist. And it's just very interesting for me, the transition from going from abstract to figurative and even then becoming nearly photographically accurate with the the portraits that you do now it's a, it's quite a transition yeah but it's gradual though over quite a long period of time in a way you know and um well i could i always feel like i'd like to go back to doing abstract it seems more a more pure kind of painting and um, it was about the the effect of color really that's what i was interested in right you know and how colors work together to create a certain mood or something yeah yeah, yeah. and kind of you could kind of see the, that the way you you 
put this block of dense color beside this. Like it's very interesting. It's someone who knows about color does that. I think. Mm. <laughs> mm. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And the other thing that I I, I really was very interested in because I'm very interested in mark making is how you know you move the paint around. It's beautiful colors, beautiful shapes. It's really kind of beautiful structures here, but as well as that, the way you leave paint just rest. And I can, this is kind of like a, a cloud of ochre, and the viewer will fit and just over the lip. But as a viewer, we know that the lip goes on. And then, as well as that, the way the other side of her chin isn't described at all, it kind of dissolves into the darkness. I think that's really lovely. Someone who understands what they're at. And again, here, the side here, there isn't a kind of a harsh line. You know, sometimes um, people use very harsh line, but in this case, there isn't. And you have these brush strokes coming from her face out into the, uh, the darkness. And I just think that's a beautiful treatment of the subject. Mm. <laughs> <Thank> you. <laughs> what can you say? <laughs> Anyway, but the only very interesting thing about this is its size. It's very, it's very big for a portrait, and you've cropped right into the face. But there's a portrait, there's a work here that's hanging, that's in it, and it's mm -hmm. this one. If people can see it, yeah, yeah and it's yeah. such a small, a small uh, portrait compared to this large one. And I'm just wondering for you, how, what is what. What are the problems and why go from large to small? And what are you trying to say then with something small as opposed to something large? Yeah, okay, there's a few things there as well. Um, and one thing I'd say is that I don't really consider these to be portraits. They're sort okay. of, um, they're sort of um, like, Babette was a refugee really fleeing from war and it's sort of a painting like that she's um and the, the idea of uh, you know um hard to explain it but she's you know it's an example of of a refugee in a way <laughs> you okay. know it, it, it happens to be Babette because i saw the film and she suited my subject but it was about um the effects of war and that type of thing so like like right up to the day, there are refugees fleeing um looking for sanctuary, as you said, you know, and they don't know what's going to happen to them there that's what waiting anxiously is putting it mildly in a way you know? yes. um, yeah yeah but um so oh, yeah. is it that you don't see this as a portrait because you don't know her personally is that it um because i if I can put it like this, it's sort of using the the face to express an emotion. It's okay. not necessarily or, or an idea, you know. It's not okay. necessarily um, a person we know, you know, because it is. She's an actress in a film that was um, a film of of a story in the book, you know. So like, there's there's a few few levels back there. It's not, yeah. uh, it's not, okay, it's not somebody I know. That's the simple way of putting it. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, Basically, you're, you're, you're using her to express this emotion that you, of, of, of fear and anguish that you, that people who are, suffer from war experience. Yeah. Because it, was, it, was, it was, that's what it was, yeah. It was an okay. exhibition, an anti-war exhibition, if you want, you know, and she right. was in it. And um, the smaller picture you have there as well um, is again. I wouldn't say it's an, it's a portrait. I've I've done several of them. The same guy again and again. Yes. And some of them are, are kind of more darker and darker. Some of them are paler and paler. That they're sort of fading away or getting mm -hmm. lost. Like again, it was in the anti-war team that um, like it, it's the ordinary foot soldiers who um, suffer and um, are dispensable, is that the word? I cannot yeah. follow them, I do. And um, so I, I did a series of them, maybe. Yeah, I can see them, some of them hanging here and the, the kind of, um, the way I describe them for people is it's, it's this expression 
repeated, except it's kind of like you had the sitter. I know, I think it was, it might have been taken from a photograph though, but that the, you are in a room where there's a dimmer switch and you can increase the light <laughs> because the very first one is very dark and yet the image is there. And as if you're bringing up the light all the way up to where there's nearly a bleached image. Yeah. With the, well, with, with the exposure of light. They started with normal color and gradually got darker and darker, actually. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, you know, they're amazing, they're amazing. And so what, when you go for something smaller, are you trying to create, because if this is, is seen in, in the context of the other images of the same, the same person with darker and lighter color schemes, it's different as to when it's met individually. It's more intimate because of its size, it will draw the person in. Yeah, actually. Um, a small painting, like you go right up to it and kind of study it, and you can yeah. see each brush stroke, and you can see the brush strokes are done with a small brush. Whereas, yeah. um, you know, you have you can't you can't make a mistake <laughs> because <laughs> it's people will be right up against it looking at it. Um, yeah. Whereas a large painting, um, because it's large, kind of it's like wow, it's kind of that's the effect it has you yeah. um, you don't necessarily know it's interesting all right you can go right up to the to the bed as well and you know look at how the brushes the brush strokes as you were talking yeah. about you know there's more um options in, in a bigger painting because you can use yeah. all sorts of different size brushes or you can use your tome or you can use your you know <laughs> wipe yeah. this way and that and um yeah. Yeah, because so, I see here uh, at the, the dark bit, the, the, the painted dribbles. I just love to see that. <laughs> well, you know, but it's just left. It's just left to do yeah, its own thing. I, I kind of liked the idea because it was like even the canvas is, is weeping, you know. It's like, crying. You know, it's wow. Yeah. wow. 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 Oh, it's stunning and really. Um, for you and for Olivier, it's such a beautiful play, a piece, and it would be lovely if people could come in to see it just to appreciate the brushwork uh, that's gone into it. Because I can't describe it with them. Um, it's like these they're these amazing shapes that just must happen very quickly. Like I'm not surprised that you did uh, that you did abstract work prior to doing this. You can see it. There's these moving shapes going across the canvas. Um, and they're just they're just stunning, and I love the way you just leave paint. You, you don't, it doesn't have to be for this for this painting. It doesn't have to be exact. You're just leaving it sit, and it runs over into another structure of the face. Here it's the lips, and yeah. um, they're, they're beautiful paintings. Mm, for the big really one, are. you spend a lot of time walking back and forth, and um, for the bigger ones, you know. Yeah. yeah. You have you have to mix more paint. You have to you have bigger brushes, and you stand back to look at it, and you go up and you stand back, and you're you're moving all the time. Whereas the yeah. little one, you're sort of right up against it all the time. So yeah, yeah. So it must be a completely different process for you. It, it actually it takes a bit of time to get um, used to changing from one to the other. You know, um, I imagine. If yeah, you're doing I imagine. for a while, you kind of. You, you have to get used to doing the big ones again or vice versa. Yeah, yeah I even say from the quantity of paint that you'd be using and the size of the paintbrushes and how yeah. they move across the canvas, yeah. I'd imagine. Rather than these, it's probably more, has to be more precise and delicate. Yeah. Yeah. And it's more, yeah. yeah. Mm. Well, Lauren, they're fantastic. I'd, um, I'd love to know what you do if you were um, asked to make a stamp for Ireland. You'd probably make an amazing stamp because you're able to go from this size to this size. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's, that's us for this evening. Yeah, I want you. to um, finish by saying thank you, by, yeah. by thanking Olivier and yourself uh, all for letting me talk about this beautiful work of art for Olivier for putting beautiful images to the story, to Ben's piece. That was piece. interesting, yeah. But the story it was lovely, yeah. That story, the story was, it was, lo it was really, for me, it was just lovely working with that story. It really was. Yeah. And finally, to everybody who joined us this evening, I hope you enjoyed it. 
and I hope you enjoyed meeting the vet through <laughs> Once Upon a Time in an Art Gallery. And I'm going to scoodle off and let Olivier close up. Anyway, thanks a million. Yes. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Hi Owen, thanks so much uh, tonight. Uh, thank you, Jean. Um, it's it's been lovely. Um, I think you know I would invite anybody to come and see this exhibition, which is running until the twenty fifth of this month. So there's a bit of time left. Uh, Babette is one of um, fifteen different paintings. There's even a series of paintings. So. It's, it's a must-see exhibition. I've been representing Owen since 2015, I think. It's a privilege to represent you, Owen. I just wanted to say that tonight. And I think there was magic between you and Jean, so thanks a lot again. And the gallery uh, is open every day except on Mondays. So again, all you have to do if you'd like to come is just give me a buzz or email me and um, just to book a time that suits you. And we are, of course, open this weekend. So again, I hope you come and see uh, COVID eyes at the gallery. And thanks everybody for joining us tonight. I hope um, the, the the internet connection was fine. We haven't done too many of those sort of um, live online with somebody in the gallery. And you know, so uh, we're still learning about those things. So um, again, I'll, I said goodbye, and again, thanks, Owen. Thanks, Jim. And it was um, a very, very interesting evening. Thank you. Thank goodbye, you. everyone. Stay safe. Bye. -bye.